Hey, hello and welcome or welcome back, I suppose. Now, throughout this video, you may notice that things seem a little bit different. I mean, God knows how much, but basically what I'm doing is I'm scripting this week. So if you see me looking up, I've got my script up behind where I've got my camera, sort of above where I've got my camera. I'm not expecting to stick beat for beat to the script, mostly because it's me and we all know what I'm like. What I needed this for is to make sure I got most, if not all, of the feelings I have about these books out, or at least the right amount of feelings about the books I'm reviewing this week out, so that the week after I can do the proper review of what I'm doing next week. Because yeah, this is going to be a two-parter. This week we'll be looking at books one and two of the Heartstopper series. I'll be doing my usual reviews here. And then next week... <laughs> Look, I'm trying to say that I'm not entirely ripping off this person. I'm paying homage to Dominic Noble's Lost in Adaptation series, uh, looking at how the TV series, I think it's a Netflix adaptation, well it's a Netflix original adaptation of these books, how good the adaptation is, as in like, you know, what they changed, what stayed the same, you know, how loyal an adaptation it is, and how much it captures that essence of Heartstopper. And, you know, I will still be doing a review of the series itself. So, from what I could find online, the TV series is based on the first two books. And then, basically, if next week... I say that something is different when it actually isn't or something seems like it's missing maybe I'm just not seeing something because it's not just a case that I'm only reviewing books one and two they're the only ones that I've read I have a little bit of knowledge of where these characters end up in the future but that is just from knowing other people that have read the series and also from reading Solitaire so Heartstopper volume one by Alice Osman is a 2019 book adapted from her webcomic series. It's a very simple love story. Boy meets boy, boy falls in love with boy, other boy falls in love with that boy. It's great, it's good stuff, and it's a lot of figuring out who you are. That kind of a vibe. And given that it's easy for me to talk about, you know, the books as a whole, because it's me, I'm probably just gonna talk about them mishmash together mostly because a lot of the themes are very similar between the two books and also because I read them in very quick succession so especially around like the sort of less plot specific stuff like the sweetest stuff I might end up going oh this was in book one but it was actually in book two and vice versa so Heartstopper Volume 2 funnily enough also by Alice Osman is a direct continuation of the first volume. In fact, I believe, I can't remember the exact chapter numbers, but I believe rather than book two starting with chapter one, it starts with, let's say, chapter four or something like that. I believe it's chapter three, but it doesn't start with chapter one. It carries on from where the last book left off. And I would say one of the biggest themes, rather than them falling in love, because they're already together by this point, it is their relationship and also to do with one of the characters really beginning to understand his like identity his sexuality that kind of thing so you've got two main characters in these books along with a host of others the main characters are charlie he's already out and you know he didn't have the easiest time of it but generally he found himself at this point he understands how things are going on he changes form ends up meeting Nick. Now, Nick, he's a bit of a sporty guy, golden and retriever personality. He believes in the beginning that he's straight, but then as his relationship develops with Charlie, he begins to realise that he's actually bisexual. So where I want to start, uh, rather than with actual review stuff, is I just want to 
little point out that recently I reviewed Solitaire, also by Alice Osman, and this is set in the same world. This is set, I want to say, a few years, or at least like about a year or so before the event of Solitaire, and you do not have to have read one to know about the other. I believe Solitaire was published in about 2014, 15, if I remember rightly. So, obviously, if you're reading at this point, you don't have to have read Heartstopper to understand Solitaire, and vice versa. I've read them separately, and mostly it was just a case of, oh, there's Tori, who's his, who is Charlie's older sister, and, you know, she is the main character of Solitaire, and she, you know, her purpose in that is to basically go, Charlie, where is your brain? Use your brain. That's basically her role in this, is like a, come on, use your brain, you can do it, you're doing great. <laughs> and yeah, she's great in this. She's as much as fun as she was, even if she's a bit more of a, well, she's not a bit more, she's far more of a background character in this. I mean, in terms of actual review, where I want to start is, this just feels like it's for the gays. It's for young gays who are just figuring themselves out. It's for old gays who wish they had a life like that. It's for the middle gays who are like, kind of maybe had a bit of a life like that, but there's still a bit of nostalgia there. And it's all just like, oh, it's just, I love it very much. It's that, you know, maybe you never got to be out or open in your teen years and you just want to live that. It's for me, my biggest thing in terms of sexuality stuff is that, and I know this seems so silly if you're not aware of it, but actually seeing the word bisexual on the page, somebody being bisexual is so rare because it's one of those sexuality, and obviously there's been reasons throughout, you know, general history of why you can't use overt terms and being bisexual was one of those that was often hinted at by saying yeah i don't really subscribe to labels um it's sort of most often used by women as well because it's like a very you know, male fantasies all that kind of thing anyway bisexual was never really a word that was that is even now used there is still a little bit of that I just don't use labels and obviously it's fine if you don't subscribe to labels but seeing in media actual bisexuality called that it's nice it feels good it just oh, feels really nice it hits something in me that I just really like because I am also a big bisexual and it's nice seeing other big bisexuals. It's just very nice. It's very sweet. Um, I mean, oh, obviously when I say this is for the gays, it's obviously not just for the gays, but it is ours. <laughs> but no, there's just something about this which feels like it is... I'm not pandering, by the way, when I say this. I mean that it is catered for us. It, it feels right, you know, for once you've got those labels being used and we're not just side characters and when there are gay and trans side characters it's just because they're in a whole host of others and it makes sense because obviously there's that idea in media of like the one gay friend in a group and don't get me wrong that does happen it's usually when you've got a large group of straight girls and there is the one gay friend that does happen it's usually you know no i don't know why i just said it's usually but yeah you know that does happen i have known it i have not been a part of those kinds of groups because all of the groups i'm in are also a group of gays i, I very rarely found myself in a group where the majority of people are straight but you know obviously it does happen but here there is that like gay group nobody feels like a token or anything like that and i love that you know you know there's a whole host of people here a whole host of identities in terms of gender and sexuality and i love that very much speaking of gender stuff so there is a character in this called and i don't know if it's l or ellie 
because so it's E L L E, which I have known people pronounce it both as L and Ellie. I'm probably going to say L because that feels right to me. And I'm pretty sure the person who I knew that was called Ellie spelled like that, everyone called her L and she had to correct them. So, yeah, let's stick with L. There is a girl called L. She is trans. And so when Nick and Charlie go to school, that's an old boys school. She used to go there, came out, obviously moved to the old girls school. It makes sense. Now, there's a group of people all hanging out, a bunch of... It's, it's Charlie and all of his friends and Nick's along for the ride and Nick is kind of like oh oh I know her she used to be X where that X would be it's not her dead name which I quite like even with fictional characters let's not be dead naming people apart from if it's you know here's the beginning of their transition to you know you see them coming out if it's a coming out story it makes sense you're gonna have both names but both names or even multiple names you don't have to settle down really quickly you know but the point i'm making is the way that alice osmond does it is i mean throughout she has like little recognizable faces uh um, when they're talking about people sometimes in the speech bubbles and stuff and it has a little picture of what you know the assumption is that that is what Elle looked like before she came out and I think that's really sweet I mean yeah there's the argument about maybe Nick shouldn't have said oh didn't that used to be blank but like A I'm not gonna get that picky and B most of the time if you don't know somebody's new name there, it, it can be difficult to know the right ways to talk about that kind of thing. It's complicated, and some people are more okay with certain ways of talking than others. And it, 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 very complicated. And I am not an expert. Just because I am trans doesn't mean I know what everything about every other trans person is feeling. So, you know, for me, it was like, yes, I understand that that's not necessarily the right way to say it. But also, it worked. And I like the little thing with the face. I thought that was sweet. I'm not in the business of being too picky, even if I am a reviewer. So I was actually watching a review recently by Savvy Wright Books. This was after I'd read it, so I was already putting my review together, and there was something that I was trying to pot in pot. There was something I was trying to pot into words that I just I couldn't figure it out, and she spoke about it. And it really made sense there and i mean this as a compliment there is a level of mundanity to this book kind of the opposite of solitaire solitaire goes off the rails it gets hog wild there's some mad shit at a festival where there's fireworks going off in people's faces somebody nearly drowns i mean there's a whole bit at the end where shit gets set on fire i'm not going to go into too many details that's not spoilers by the way like it's set up that shit gets that he just escalates and escalates and escalates and that is the charm of that book it is the charm of a lot of teen and young adult fiction it's like a bit wild you know it's fantasy and i don't mean fantasy in terms of genre i mean fantasy in terms of you know a life you might want to live even if it's a bit wild you would never actually want to live that life because that would be horrible it would be terrifying but i like this because it feels real in a way that you know like i'm saying a lot of teen fiction a lot of young adult fiction doesn't and that's not to say that certain things couldn't happen but i was talking about a good girl's guide to murder recently and it it's great, it's a bit of escapism, all that kind of stuff, but not the most realistic that you've got some sixth former solving crimes for a, not NVQ, what is it called? EPQ? Was that it? I can't remember the acronym, but you know what I'm talking about, right? The thing with this is that it's like, you know, the whole world feels real and i don't just mean like oh this is set clearly just in the uk in some like sixth form yeah it's gonna feel real i mean 
these characters and their si and like the situations they're in feel so real. It, it's like you know you might have lived this life if you're older. You could be living this life right now. It, this might be the sort of life that you do want or would have wanted for yourself. It, it, it's so easy to play into the fantasy of this life and I again I don't mean fantasy as in like you know big fucking dragons and shit like that I just mean this seems like the sort of life that a lot of people would want to escape into even though it's like a couple guys going bowling with their friends they're just hanging out walking dogs and they're texting but it's like so sweet and yeah I don't know if it would have worked I mean, obviously, a major aspect of this story is that it's about coming to terms with sexuality and that kind of thing. But I don't think this story in itself could have worked had it just been straight couple romance. Yeah, sure, you've got, like, mundane straight couple romance stuff that I do like. Even if there's a little bit of, like, fiery stuff in there, it's a little bit out there. Mundane stuff. I read... Even though, I mean, this is not a romance, if anything, quite the opposite. It's about, you know, breaking up with somebody. But, you know, you've got something like Out of Love. It is so viscerally real. <laughs> I mean, that's not necessarily, like, the fantasy to escape into. But it is very much based in reality. Um, this works because it feels the same. Well, it doesn't feel the same. But what I mean is that kind of... There's a level of reality to it. You know what I mean. I'm rambling a little bit because I'm not looking at my script. I'm not doing what I said I would do because I'm terrible at doing my job. So, you know, a big plot point in this... You know, a big plot point in both of these books is that Charlie kind of accidentally found himself with a bit of a type. His first boyfriend... Boyfriend... Complicated. It's called Ben. Now, Ben clearly couldn't come out yet for whatever reason. Either it's that he didn't want to deal with the repercussions from guys at school, or maybe there was some other stuff going on that I don't know about yet. Maybe there is some stuff at home, that kind of thing. But for whatever reason, he couldn't come out yet, or wouldn't come out yet. But he still remained with Charlie. There's nothing wrong with that. You can keep a relationship a little bit secret as long as you can deal with that. It can be very stressful. I have done it. <laughs> it can be stressful. But there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And, you know, that's hard when you're teenagers. Because you're figuring everything out that you are when you're a teenager anyway. And then add all, like, sexuality stuff on top of that. And it's just like, this is too much. And what Ben does is he takes that out on Charlie. He makes it as if that's Charlie's problem that he can't come out. But he's still happy to sneak into rooms, make out with him, like, string him along, even though he's got a girlfriend, all that kind of stuff. And then Nick comes along. Now, when they first get together, he makes it clear that he's probably not going to be able to come out yet. Mostly because at first, he doesn't even know what he would be coming out as. He's just like, but I've been into girls my whole life. I'm definitely still into girls. <laughs> Bisexuality, my darling. You'll figure it out, and he does figure it out, and it's bloody lovely. But, like, for him... Uh, for both of them, they're worried that the same thing's going to happen again. You know, for Charlie, he doesn't want to be treated like shit again. And for Nick, he cares about Charlie and doesn't want to treat him like shit again. But he realises that that's not... He, very quickly, he realises that that's not Charlie's problem. That's his problem to figure out. And, you know, they do, and it's nice, and it's lovely. You know... Also, you know, you've got to remember that the background of all of this is that the two of them are at an old boys school. That's going to add extra pressure on the idea of coming out. I've never been to an old boys school, but I imagine 
it's very much a big masculine like there's no real coming out there if you're gay you are a target i mean as if you're not a target in uh whatever you like a mixed gender school or anything like that but th there is something very particular about the idea of an old boy school where you would become a target for that and yeah so the, what i'm saying with you know the idea of all that coming to terms with stuff and not coming out and then you know this background of an old boy school is that again that's so real you know whenever there is homophobia in this because there is Again, all boys school and teenagers in general are dickheads. Not all teenagers, obviously, not all teenagers, but like on the whole, there's you know, something particularly vicious about the way that teenagers and kids are mean compared to the way that adults are. And. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, my brain fell out there, and I'm not entirely scripting this bit, but I think it's still important. So the homophobia in it is realistic, and it doesn't feel... Oh, I don't know how to phrase this, because sometimes when you're watching something, or reading something, where you have gay characters, and then they're attacked for this, I'm sure the there is a similarity here with the way people you know the way there's sexism with women racism with people of color any of that kind of thing where you've got sometimes it feels like somebody's writing somebody being hateful as an excuse to use certain words now thankfully in this as far as i remember none of those words are used and if they are it didn't stick out to me in a, oh, Alice Osman's just trying to drop the F-bomb or something like that. And again, I don't think she does. Mostly because it's a UK book. A UK book. It's a British book. British author as well, as far as I'm aware. That word is less likely to be used. Maybe it is a bit more now. Just because, you know, Americans. But, you know, American vernacular infiltrating a lot of British culture and that kind of thing. But, point I'm making is that... The homophobia feels purposeful and it's not look these people are downtrodden or look i can get to use the slurs just because these people are being hateful it feels correct it feels natural as well and you know there's some comeuppance for these bell ends so that's always enjoyable and yeah, obviously, I bloody love these books. Uh, in the future, I'm probably going to read the rest of the series. I'm not sure how similar the web series is to the actual books. I might, I, I'm, I was considering doing full adaptation, but as far as I'm aware, it is pretty much one for one. The webcomic to book with maybe a bit of layout changes the story is exactly the same there's probably very little dialogue changes as well so i don't see much point in me doing that now what i do know is that later in the series there are some much darker moments especially surrounding charlie so obviously i've read solitaire and his storyline in that um is probably fucking dark it's especially surrounding i mean his mental health is awful in general and there's clearly some stuff that just isn't really explored in solitaire because he's not a lead character but it particularly seems to be surrounding food now i don't know if there's more to it than that beyond it being some form of disordered eating that kind of thing or if there is something different that is just affecting his relationship with it but I'm aware of that, um, again, because of the way one of my friends has spoken about this series and having read Solitaire, um, and I think that is something to bear in mind if you're wanting to read this series, if you're not aware that that's where it goes, because, again, I know a few people that have said it sort of comes a bit out of nowhere, 
but I don't know how that's handled. I'm not going to talk about that because it's not my place, because I haven't actually read it. It's only things that I've heard, but yeah. The handling seemed okay in solitaire from the glances that we saw, so I'm going to assume the actual handling of it isn't too bad. Yeah, but obviously, you know, wider context, you know, confronting a head-on is a bit different, but, you know, I'm going to assume that generally the handling of it is, o is okay, it just could have been brought into the picture with a bit more forewarning, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's my review of Heartstopper, I bloody loved it if you're thinking about reading it maybe you've watched the series and you want to read it or you've heard so much about it because it's everywhere at the minute give it a go it's great fun and they they look longer than they kind of are kind of thing it's not a lot of little panels so yeah they're about 100 to 200 pages but they're a quick read they're not super like you know, it's not super fine print, that kind of thing. Pretty easy to get through. I absolutely recommend it. It's great fun. It's either going to be, you know, for my fellow post-schooling gays kind of thing. It's either going to be a case of nostalgia or it's going to be a case of, oh, I wish that's what I would have had. Ah. Either way, bloody lovely. I adore it and I am. 100% going to be reading the rest of the series and come back next week for my review of the Netflix series and also to see how well it did adapt the books. So take care everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day, a wonderful night, a wonderful whenever you are watching this. I will see you all very soon for some more Heartstopper content. Goodbye. Right.